Hey everyone, this is Brian from the Tennis IQ Podcast. Josh and I hope that you are enjoying the content and discussions that we put out week after week. If you'd like to support the podcast and help us to continue to produce quality episodes, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash tennis IQ podcast slash membership. Currently, we have three tiers of support, the fan level at $3 per month, the supporter level at $7 per month, and the champion level at $20 per month. Benefits of joining the Tennis IQ podcast community include episode transcripts, participation in book club discussions, and access to monthly masterclasses with me and Josh. For more on these benefits of support, head on over to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash tennis IQ podcast slash membership. Thank you so much. And now, on to the show. Welcome to the Tennis IQ Podcast. I'm Brian Lomax. And I'm Josh Berger. And for today's episode, we are going to discuss what to do when things aren't working. And I, as as Brian and I were talking before this episode, I think this is something that we both see quite a bit. Um, And you even see it, you you see it at all levels of tennis, ranging from um, beginners to Um, experienced players, whether they be juniors or adults, um, you know, all the way up to even the professionals. And, uh, you know, certainly for for them, it uh, for the best players in the world, it certainly looks different. But I think every tennis player has had the experience of being in a match and things aren't working. Nothing's working. Um, Could be a particular stroke, whether it's their serve or their backhand or forehand or or volley or whatever it may be that's just completely broken down, or it could feel like your whole game in general, that nothing's working and just things aren't going well. And, and maybe, you know, either you can't figure out why, or you maybe haven't taken the steps to figure out why and to proceed from there. So we're going to talk about some different angles of this in terms of both what, what players can do in those moments um, also, I think a, a different angle could be what could players do to prepare for this possibility or maybe even inevitability of this happening. Um, but but I think we'll we'll definitely discuss what to do when this is happening and and I think provide a few steps, pr- provide some some different tips and suggestions, um, but also talk about some root causes that could be causing it in the first place, it, which could also um, maybe shift a player's perspective or mindset on getting tight in the first place if and when it happens. Yeah, and I think, as you said, Josh, this is a question we get a lot. Um, We get it so often that I actually created a document called What to Do When Things Are Not Working. And I think the first thing we want to understand is a little bit more around the root causes. Because most of what is being discussed are symptoms of something that, you know, is an underlying cause to why you might be experiencing a part of your game or your whole game not working. And we don't want to just address the symptoms. And I think players and coaches tend to look at physical solutions or technical solutions more so than than addressing why there might be some more cognitive types of issues going on that are leading to a physical issue. So like a serve would be an example. And I've heard this many times where a player will say their serve was not working. And then maybe their coach saw it or they had a conversation with their coach and they're like, well, all right, we'll go back out onto the court and we'll work on your serve. And I was like, that that could be okay. Maybe that will increase your confidence in your serve. Perhaps one of the reasons your serve was not working that day is that you you don't fully believe in it. You don't have a lot of intense trust on that serve and and therefore more reps can be helpful toward that. But most likely the cause of the breakdown is is something different. And I think when we start to analyze potential root causes and then what their effects are, we might look at things like, did you come into this match with any particular expectations or pressure? Because we know that can lead to tighter muscles. Um, it might lead to, you know, more overthinking, more distracted 
focus than being in the present moment. Um, did you come into this match for some reason with a lack of confidence, either in a particular stroke or just a lack of belief with respect to this opponent? That can obviously cause some some problems, especially if you have a lack of confidence in a in a particular stroke or or you know something like your serve. Maybe you don't have a game plan. Maybe maybe you don't believe in the game plan. Maybe you don't like the opponent. There are a lot of different things that I think can change your body chemistry, which can then have an impact on your game. So you know, we were talking about a model, Josh, that I think you can present. To me, there are some there are some primary adjustments to make, and then there are some secondary ones. And I think as you know, you go through the, the kind of the four, I think there were four parts maybe to the model that you shared or that we discussed earlier, we can kind of talk about what, what those are. Um, so I think, yeah, understanding root causes, not just treating symptoms is an important part of this process and, and getting players to buy into that and not just want to go to technical adjustments in a match, not just go to tactical or strategic adjustments right away. At some point, they might be okay, but they're probably not the first things we want to do. Totally, totally. And I think to me, the first thing, and I, I guess, um, I, I guess we could think of it as sort of four steps or, or a model in that way is we want to evaluate. We want to evaluate the situation. Okay. Um, I'm feeling this way, but can I, can I take a step back? Can I try to evaluate what's actually happening, right? Whether that be the root causes that are leading to it. Um, and also just understanding, um, what, what is, what am I actually experiencing, right? Whether it's, um, muscle tension, which, which, you know, is, which causes tightness. And, um, you know, I think is, is something that a lot of players uh, talk about, complain about as, as, you know, one of the, the reasons why things aren't going that, going that well. So I think, you know, can we evaluate and be aware of, and w- which would really be another, another piece of that model. Can we be aware of what we're experiencing? Okay. So if it's, if it's that, tightness, that muscle tension. Okay. Where am I experiencing it? It's generally not in our entire bodies. Generally, it may be one part of our body or one muscle group. Um, Doing something like progressive muscle relaxation can be a nice, a nice tool to, to help build that awareness or also body scan meditations. Um, But just so that somebody can build that awareness and start to recognize where am I actually feeling that tension? Is it in my arms? Is it in my legs or my back or wherever it may be, um, can I just start to to notice where that's coming from? And then also, hopefully, if we've done some progressive muscle relaxation, we've actually built the skill of um, trying to release some of that tension in that muscle group once we're aware of where it's actually coming from. Um, we can also shake out our arms and legs and do things like that. Um, a lot of this stuff can, can certainly be connected to breathing as well. So if we can um, focus on taking some you know, some, some solid breaths during that time that can also help us to, to loosen up. Um, but I, I think when it comes to that, that evaluation phase, um, I think it's also, you know, I also think about, um, a book, the book winning ugly, where Brad Gilbert talks about, um, you know, trying to understand in the match, trying to understand who's doing what to who. And, you know, I think, what I often see is a player goes into a match, maybe they have certain expectations going into that match, which is certainly common um, of maybe winning or this should be easy or I should win or things like that. And then things don't go, things don't start off the way that we want to, but can we evaluate at that point? Can we evaluate the situation, understand what actually is happening, right? Okay. It's I'm down four one in this first set. Okay. Well, why who's doing what to who? Maybe I'm, spraying too many errors and I might, you know, there's just way too many unforced errors on my, on my side of things. Maybe my opponent is really breaking down my backhand, right? Maybe I am not using my strengths the way that I want to, right? Like, can we, as part of that evaluation phase, it's partly how are we feeling? It's partly evaluating maybe our expectations and how we went into the match in the first place. And then I think it's also partly, you know, of evaluating the match itself and the dynamics of the match and understanding, you know, who's doing what to whom, why are the, why is the score, why, 
are things the way that they are? And then based on that, then we can get to some of these later steps. I think if we look at evaluate or maybe, maybe awareness is separate and it's ahead of evaluate. Um, I could say that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because I think to me, when we're looking at primary versus secondary, we, I think we have to understand those root causes. Um, if you're feeling great, okay. And then it's a lot about who's doing what to whom, then that's fine. I think that that's, when I hear this question, that's generally not the first thing that's a problem. It's usually more to do with some pressure or expectations or confidence issues. Um, in which case, I think going to one's body chemistry is probably the first route. Um, and so you mentioned breathing, Josh. I think that's great. We want to try to bring some belly breaths and some rhythm to that. So, you know, in my document, I suggest like a three second inhale, five second exhale, hold for a second, try that a couple of times. And before the next point starts, I'd really like a player to only be breathing through his or her nose so that they're truly calm. Breathing through your mouth repeatedly actually raises cortisol levels and anxiety. So we want to try to use our, our nose as much as, as possible. You mentioned the shaking out stuff. I think that's great. Um, you know, I, just a quick story here. I, I, I'm sure you have felt this too, Josh, where something isn't working. And I remember playing a practice match a couple of years ago, maybe more than a couple of years ago. And I'm playing this guy who's a good player and likes to chip and charge on an opponent's second serve. So you're feeling some pressure to get the first serve in. And I remember the first point of the match, hit my first serve, and it was terrible. <laughs> you know, it didn't go in or whatever. And I felt super tight because I knew that I had to, you know, I was using that language, I had to get it in or else he's going to be on top of the net in the next one. And fortunately, because of, you know, having done this work a lot, I recognized it. So I took a step back took a couple of breaths, bounced up and down, hit my second serve. But then the rest of the match, I had a really high first serve percentage because I was very aware that I needed to be looser. I needed to slow myself down much more. So like when I'm tense on the serve, the motion tends to speed up. Therefore, it's a little bit less in control. So this is an awareness thing. Can you be aware of like, are you maybe speeding things up? Are you too tight? Those are your, I would say, your primary adjustments first. Um, because I think most of the time we get the question is probably around this stuff. There may be players who are like, hey, I was playing great, but this guy is just like destroying me. Okay, yes, we then need to go to some, to some secondary types of things. So the more that people can learn to be aware of their physical relaxation state, be aware of, you know, what are some of the symptoms of that? So I think mishitting balls is a symptom that you're too tight. Um, picking your head up before you make contact, taking your head out of the contact zone is a, is a sign that you're a little bit nervous or anxious about something. Maybe you're trying to see where the ball is going before you've actually made contact. That can also lead to uh, mishitting the ball. Um, certainly not generating enough racket head speed. So what does racket head speed do for us as players? It adds spin. It adds control. It, you know, it also helps you create more power. So if you're leaving the ball short in the court or you're kind of spraying the ball, it would indicate that there's something going on with your racket head acceleration. Maybe you're decelerating. So that's, that's a symptom of being too tight. So if these are some of the things that you're noticing with your game, then, then we want to go to more of these primary types of things of breathing, relaxing, slowing things down, take more time between points, do some real breathing and, and visualization on a changeover. Again, all about kind of resetting yourself. It's like, can you restart the whole computer here? Just shut down, <laughs> restart, and that's what that part of that process is. Um, so I just want to get your thoughts on that, Josh, as maybe more primary adjustments for players when, when they're going through this based on an awareness of what's really happening with their strokes in their game. 
Yeah, I think I think it makes a lot of sense, right? If we can if we can get to that point of um of of just being curious, of being curious, of being aware of of, of what's happening, I think that that tends to be a, a really great starting point. And I agree that, you know, if we were to come up with a model, that that awareness piece would come first because I think it, it really is a primary factor that 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 needs to be taken into consideration. Okay. Can I be aware of myself? you know, sort of point A, right? We we talked about this um, with, with Jorge Capistani, actually. He talked about the three levels of tennis IQ and we we had the interview with him. And, um, you know, and that really is the the first point. And I think it's, you know, if we're not aware of ourself, if we're not in control of ourself, you know, if we don't recognize what's happening, it's really tough to be recognize what's happening with, with an opponent or with somebody else. So I think I, I really do agree that that is um, an, an important place to start. And then once we're able to recognize it, right, whether it's that tension, whether it's the dynamics of the match, whether it's, you know, how, how are we feeling physically or what expectations did we bring into it or, or some of these different factors, then we're able to, you know, think about what needs to be done. And that doesn't necessarily need to be an adjustment. It, it could be an adjustment. I agree with you that far too often players jump to adjustments, whether it's a technical shift, right? Maybe they're trying to do something differently with one of their strokes and and they are maybe not using it as much and they they're trying to to do a technical shift mid match, which I think is, is, is challenging to say the least. Um, Or if it's more of a strategic shift in in terms of, um, you know, whether it's, trying to maybe aim for different targets or maybe coming to net more or slicing more, or, you know, hitting more top spin or whatever it may be. Um, but I think, yeah, once we can get through sort of some of those earlier stages, like the awareness and evaluation stage, then we can move on. And I think, I, I think what's really important. And I know Brian, I know we, we talked about this be, before we started recording, but I think simplifying, I think simplifying tends to really be a, um, something that 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 t- tends to lead to positive results in these situations right nothing's working can we go back to the basics can we simplify things can we go to the fundamentals and you know i, I think some people especially maybe more advanced players um might be like oh well of course i have the fundamentals down but oftentimes when nothing's working those fundamentals are what's breaking down right and, and we can think about um, certain fundamentals, right? We can we can think about things like watching the ball, um, moving our feet, um, you know, having enough margin on our shot so that we're not aiming an inch or two over the net um, with a shot with zero spin whatsoever, or aiming for the lines. Um, you know, th- things like hitting the ball cross court. You know, we can think about some of these main sort of bread and butter fundamentals and. Oftentimes, if we can really be aware and evaluate what we're doing and the dynamics of the match, we will find that we're not doing those things if if nothing's working, right? So if we can, you know, at that point, okay, I'm aware of it, I'm recognizing it, and then can I simplify some of those things? Can I just commit to being on my on my toes and you know just trying to 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 play everything from being on my toes, which you know to me as someone. You know, I, I think I've talked about this in the past, but footwork, I think, you know, I, I think I can be pretty quick around the court and play some pretty good defense. But I think my footwork in general um, hasn't always been a strength. And I think, you know, just almost even that reminder of just trying to stay on my toes as much as possible, you know, split stepping, taking small adjustment steps, that sort of thing can make a huge difference. Right. It's a fundamental of the game, but it, it makes a huge difference. Watching the ball. Right. We've talked about. Um, Tim Galloway in the inner game of tennis. We had Sean Brawley on for an episode who worked with him for for many years and talked about you know a drill such as balance hit that trains you to track the ball um, and just you know I think many players have had that experience of starting to notice that when you really make a conscious effort to watch the ball track the ball it makes a huge difference. You end up making much better contact. You end up putting your body in the right position to hit to to hit the ball more cleanly. 
Um, so I think, you know, if we can really commit to these fundamentals, make sure we're doing them solidly. I think what it does is in a certain way, it, it helps us make sure that we're not beating ourselves. And I think oftentimes when nothing's working, what what is happening to a, to a large degree, and then not always, but I think oftentimes is we're beating ourselves. We're maybe making too many errors. We're maybe leaving the ball way too short where our opponent can you know, relatively easily capitalize on it. Um, and we're beating ourselves where I think if we can really commit to those fundamentals, be aware of what's going wrong, and then, you know, keep it simple on those fundamentals, we give ourselves such a better chance to to not beat ourselves. We give ourselves such a better chance to, you know, to make sure that we're at least giving ourselves um, giving ourselves a fighting chance in the match because we're we're doing some of those basic things right. I think beating ourselves is often comes down to mental errors or decision making errors. And when we're, you know, in this state of feeling like things aren't working, we tend to overcomplicate things. Our thinking goes more to, towards problems and creating stories. And simplifying helps us to shift back to more solution and action oriented thinking. So yeah, part of your part of your shift to simplifying things should also be to take a breath or two to make that shift, to kind of get out of that problem story type of thinking and shifting over. That's the that's the bridge between those two things is take a breath or two so that you can slow things down in your mind. And now you can begin to think about solutions, taking action. And a lot of those are going to be simplifications. Let's hit the ball cross court. Let's watch the ball better. 100% agree with everything you said going to those fundamentals. I think the one thing I would throw in on top of what you said, Josh, would be just maybe even increase your effort level. Just take your intensity up. Just try harder out there a little bit with with the effort. Um, footwork is great. Focus more on balance. Focus on, like you said, split step, but also wide base. A lot of these things, bringing more discipline to those fundamentals can be super helpful. Uh, looking to use your strengths more in that situation. These are the shots you love to hit. If you love hitting your forehand, all right, let's see if we can try to hit more forehands somehow. If that's like crazy running around your backhand, oh, fine. You like this shot. You enjoy hitting this shot. That's probably naturally going to make you start to feel a little bit better out there. Um, and I think with all of the adjustments that we're talking about, one of the key things with this is try not to see it as a quick fix. We have to be patient with this process. This is not like a light switch on a wall. Hey, I, I breathed once, I bounced up and down, and it didn't work. And that's just not how it is. And, and sometimes you'll see people abandon doing the right things because they supposedly didn't work in favor of going back to what we know wasn't working. And it's hard to do the right things and not see that immediate benefit, but the more that you're doing the right things, the more you can come off the court and say, hey, I tried to solve the problem. I tried to do the right things. Maybe it worked, maybe it didn't, but you can be proud of yourself for trying to do something productive rather than just sticking with what wasn't working. Because in essence, that's beating yourself. But I would also say, Josh, that that's a form of tanking. You're not really trying anymore. You're not trying to solve the problem if you just go back to whatever. So it's really, I think, imperative to be patient with this stuff. And it's to, you know, to be aware of, of your body state, but also be aware of the dynamics of the match, as you noted, with the who's doing what to whom. And, and breaking things down into nice, simple aspects of the game so that you can start to feel better and rebuild some confidence Get back to what Jorge Capistani calls level three of tennis IQ, where you're more focused on mentally and physically disrupting your opponent. You know, David Samuel talks about that as well. The whole idea is to make your opponent feel mentally uncomfortable. We're also doing that through some physical discomfort. So understanding, sabotaging, disrupting rhythm as another thing to be thinking about. Maybe that's even a, a little bit more complex, but um, 
I think, you know, simplify is very important part of this process, whether it's on the sort of the primary side with your body chemistry and certainly with, with your game. The cross court thing is one I really like to use with players. Like when I was doing some college coaching and you would see a player struggling as a coach, we can kind of, you know, intercede there and just say, next few points, everything's cross court. And inevitably they play better. Because what have you done? You have given them a constraint. You have given them a rule to follow. You're not actually allowing them for these next few points to make any decisions other than hitting the ball cross court. And now they can start to rebuild some of those things. Most of us have to bring that coaching voice, you know, ourselves. You don't have somebody on the side of the court doing that for you. But setting, you know, constraints or rules for yourself can also be a great simplification of what you're doing. Definitely. And and there are, there are obviously a lot of benefits to, to hitting cross court, right? I mean, there's you're hitting into just a, a larger portion of court, lower part of the, you know, lower part of the net. Um, you know, it's, there there's really are a lot of benefits to hitting cross court in general. So you're you're providing them with a restraint, but you're also, you know, so w- which can certainly simplify their thinking process, their decision-making process, but you're also helping them to just just make solid decisions, right? In general, if we can be going cross-court more often, we are going to probably make less errors, if you make fewer errors. You know, we're, we're probably going to, um, you know, be, be putting more pressure on our opponent through our consistency as well. So I, I, I think that's a great, great um, suggestion there. Um, and I, I guess if we were thinking about, you know, that that final st- stage, right, starting with those first three stages of awareness, evaluation, simplification, and then it's adjustment, but adjustment if necessary, right? Not jumping to adjustment right off the bat, not even saying that we need to make huge adjustments, but it's more so adjustment if we need to, right? Whether that's adjustment of our game plan, whether that's maybe um mental adjustments right if we if we've evaluated that that's and and that is tied in with the simplification piece but i think it's you know i i think it can it doesn't always mean simplification right sometimes it means we need to you know through our awareness we start to recognize that our opponent has a certain weakness right that they don't um approach the net well let's just say um you know so every short ball that you hit them every drop shot or short ball they seem to struggle with it they seem to struggle with that approach shot they seem to struggle with their volleys okay how can we make an adjustment with our own game in mind with our own strengths and our own playing style in mind to capitalize on that and that takes some thought. That takes some thought. Okay, how can we put together a game plan? Can we make some adjustments as needed? Can we think about patterns that might work in a situation like that? Um, so that that would be an example of a more of a strategic adjustment. But as you said, Brian, and I certainly agree, I think it, it often is mental. It often is, you know, what is the mindset that we're bringing into the match in the first place? How are we viewing our opponents? Have we been able to let something go from earlier in the match, whether it's a line call we disagree with or the score, right? Are we using our tools, right? Whether it's our routine, whether it's our breathing, whether it's, um, you know, our self-talk, whether it's so many of these different tools, are we doing that? And if not, can we make an adjustment there? So I think, you know, that that really to me is maybe that that final stage that it's, you know, if if necessary, if we deem that it's necessary, that's when the adjustment takes place, but not really until we've gone through some of these earlier steps of, of the awareness piece of evaluation and, and you know, of really simplifying and going back to the basics and going back to, you know, the, the real fundamentals of the game. And I think everything that we're talking about, whether it's the primary stuff, the secondary stuff, the adjustments, it's a lot about getting your focus to be in the present moment right? Breathing. It's all about being aware of what's going on right now. What do I want to do right now? And so I think the more that players, listeners can think about, okay, I need to be present more. I have to release some of these things from past points. Because I think the formula here is, again, let's say we're coaching somebody and they're, they're, they're doing this, right? We give them some things to try. My Really, my mission for them is I just want you to play one point. 
All right, that's it. Let's just play one point. Let's see how it goes. We're going to do all these things again, and then we're going to repeat that. And we're simply going to try to play, to raise the quality of our tennis one point at a time. College coaching is great for this kind of thing, you know, when, when a player's breaking down, because we can have that conversation every single point. You can be that reminder system for that player and help them stay focused on, on the one point. It's obviously much harder for, for players who are not able to have that level of, of coaching and dialogue. But of course, that's what you're training your mind to do. So if there can even be some scripts, you mentioned earlier, Josh, you know, preparing for this, we should be prepared that something's going to break down. So if you can have some of these things in your mind going out onto the court with pre-programmed responses, then this will go much better. You'll know, all right, here's some simplification things I could do. I can go across court. I can use my, my strengths. I can increase my hustle, whatever. Um, you know, if, if anybody wants the document that I created, I'm happy to send it to, to anyone. Um, but it's, it's, I think you were right when you said that in the beginning, if we're more prepared for this to happen, because this is a real situation that happens to everybody, then it won't be kind of like looking around like, oh, what do I do? It'll be more like, okay, this is normal. These are some of the things that I know work for me. I will go through this and, and we'll see how it goes. And in the end, you can be, you can be proud of yourself. So um, even having an, an algorithm like, you know, if this, then that, right? If this is how I'm feeling, then I do that. If this is what's happening in my game, then I do this. Um, and really just even breaking it down into a bunch of if-then statements. So yeah, preparing for this stuff I think is super important and, um, and helping us just to be more in that present moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think uh, another piece of preparing for this to potentially happen, um, and, I, and I think it's important that we do that because I think that's realistic. It's realistic that there will be days where things aren't working. There will be days where it feels like you're trying everything and, and things aren't working um, and things are just breaking down. But I think what what's really one, one tool that can be really helpful here is visualization. And I mean, this is something even that goes as far back as the Stoics. The Stoics talked about this idea of, of uh, negative visualization and thinking about what could go wrong. I mean, they, they would, you know, they, they would talk about that and, and, you know, can you sort of prepare for that? Can you be ready for that, that things aren't always going to be going according to plan? Things aren't always going to be going swimmingly, but, you know, the, a great player can handle those days, right? We, we've seen um, Nadal lose sets six love and come back, right? Or Djokovic or, you know, or Serena or Iga Sviantek or so many top players. We can think about matches where they've turned things around, where they were not feeling their best. They were not playing their best. You look at them and you're like, this is this is the number one player in the world. Really, they're, they're certainly not showing that right now. But what what makes them... You know, one of the big factors that makes them so great is that they have that ability to turn things around. Um, so I think, yes, using something like negative visualization can be really helpful. Um, you know, putting yourself, and we can talk more about visualization and, and more so the how, and, and we have in, in previous episodes, but um, being able to really put yourself in that moment, um, you know, and sort of mentally rehearse it of, Okay, nothing's things aren't working well right now. Okay, can I essentially rehearse? Can I plan out how I want to respond in this situation? And I think it's a lot of the steps that we've talked about today, but can I rehearse that? Can I plan it out? Can I think about, okay, if this happens, this is what I want to do. And I like what you said, Brian, sort of that that if then, then yeah, sorry. Um if if this, then, then that. That. right, thank you. Um, because it, it simplifies it. Okay. This is happening. Okay. Then that, then that's what I'm going to do about it. And I have a, I have a clear game plan. I don't necessarily have to go through all the different thinking that we've, that we've talked about today in the episode, which I think can be very helpful because we've prepared for it. Um, so I think preparing for it, visualizing it, um, there's 
of course, a lot of research about the benefits of visualization, and it can really make us feel as if we've been in that situation many times before, and we can essentially rehearse how we want that moment to go. And I think the last thing I wanted to add is just a an important reminder um, that things can turn around. Matches have twists and turns. Matches have ups and downs. And I think that's an important reminder. I think I think it's very easy to get into the headspace when nothing's working and when you're losing that that it's inevitable that okay this is just the way that the match is going to go it's just not my day but with that attitude that that generally I don't want to say guarantees because there's really no guarantees out there but it it certainly increases the likelihood of nothing changing and it not being your day but if you're able to do some of these things that we're talking about, go through this process, um, then, you know, things certainly can turn around. But I think just that, even that reminder that things can turn around is really important. Um, even being able to put yourself in your opponent's shoes, recognizing that it's not so easy to finish off sets and close out a set. It's not so easy to close out a match, right? Your opponent can get nervous. Your opponent's game can fall apart, right? There there can always be, there can always be, ups and those ups and downs, those twists and turns, we see it all the time. So I think just remembering that can also give you, you know, can, can also sort of lighten things up a little bit, can give you that boost of confidence, can give you that feeling of optimism that things can turn around potentially. But, you know, but it, it so I, I think being able to um, think that way and sort of remind yourself of, of some of that um, can be a can be a helpful impetus as well in terms of starting to turn it around and and you know and and you know going through that process maybe making adjustments but really you know simplifying things and and you know and and more than anything I think just being aware of the situation and 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 being aware of what's working what's not what's getting in the way what's the issue and then really what can we do about it. For sure on that, you know, last point there, Josh, we want to remember we are playing another human being. And if we go back to some of the higher levels of tennis IQ, the purpose, our main purpose out there, our mission is to make them uncomfortable physically, mentally. And you don't do that if you essentially stop trying. That just makes it a lot easier for your opponent. So yeah. if the more that we can be thinking about that, keep that mission in mind then then a lot of this becomes a little bit easier to do. Not that it's anything as easy out there, but these are the things that we want to try to do to keep ourselves proud of our effort, win or lose. We did everything we could. That's, that's a lot of where personal satisfaction comes from. We know we played with great attitude. We did everything we could. Somebody's got to win. Somebody's got to lose. So that's our show for today. Thank you all for listening. For more on today's episode, please check out the show notes. If you have any feedback or questions for the two of us, please email us at tennisiqpodcast at gmail.com. Also, if you're enjoying the content that Josh and I discuss on the show, please rate and review the podcast so other tennis enthusiasts can find it more easily. Additionally, to be notified of new episodes, please subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice, including YouTube. And you can also check us out on Instagram. If you would like to support the podcast, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash tennis IQ podcast slash membership, where you can learn about the benefits of being part of the tennis IQ podcast community. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon in our next episode.